Hey ho, Tudor minded people. I'm Gage. I'm Jessica. We're Tudor Time Machine, and this is the third episode of our podcast. Every episode, Jesse will read from Time's Riddle, a story project we're working on, and then we'll share some of the history behind the reading. We hope everyone will go on over to the Tudor Time Machine Facebook page and join our Tudor minded community. In this episode, we are leaving Cecilia and Constance and the world of the gentry. We're going into London town to meet a young innkeeper. So, Tudor minded people, let's start. Chapter 3 The Arundel Inn, in which Philomena Arundel loses a cheating steward and gains a mysterious box. Philomena was outraged. I see, I see what you have done. These pages are strewn with faults. The puffy old goat held himself with righteous authority. I balance the figures as your mother instructed, mistress. If there is profit missing from the inn, perhaps she took it for herself, for a gown or some other indulgence, and failed to make a record. It is you who twisted and hid receipts. Mistress Millicent is ill, her mind clouded. I have not been able to do things as they ought to have been done. Philomena wanted to spit at him, to hit him, to make him show an ounce of shame. What kind of a man blames the sick woman? For months, Philomena suspected Joseph Stickley had been cheating. An examination of the inn's ledger had confirmed her fear. She was the authority now. The decision was hers. You have no place here. I release you. She felt tall, commanding, but she forced herself to frown. You are too young to speak to me thus. You do not have the power to command me, Mistress Philomena. You are mistaken, sir. My mother has left the inn to my charge, and I release you. He shifted uneasily. After my service to Mistress Millicent, you will not believe there was a misunderstanding? I understand well enough that we have been cheated. The concerns of a man who lives extravagantly, but shortly will have no income, rushed onto Stickley's face. Mistress, you can leave, or I will have the tower throw you out. The tower dubbed rather unimaginatively as he possessed great height, had appeared in her mother's service a few years before, and was still only a shaggy, overgrown lad. But her mother, and now herself, counted him as one of their most valued servants. The great boy stepped purposefully to help the steward find the way out. Joseph Stickley cringed, as if a great storm cloud had appeared overhead, and begged, Mistress, you are too young to have all of this on your shoulders. I have served you. Go, sir. Pox on you. Stickley spat as he lunged out the door. May your brats die in the womb. Philomena felt drained. She could not remember ever having lost her temper so grossly. With her mother's illness, the steward had seemed a godsend. It was a bitter disappointment that he had been cheating, so predictable and yet such a kiss of Judas. Poor mother, Philomena thought, once so sharp, now pray to the master Stickleys of the world. When her mother returned, would Philomena tell her of Joseph Stickley, of the pilfering of the stores by the baker, or the scullery maid's light fingers? If her mother was ever well enough to come back. Philomena said a quick prayer to halt the thought from flying into the ether. Her mother would return, and she, Philomena, would show the inn well cared for, profitable, and ready for its mistress. Philomena heard the rustle of her maidservant, Marianne, in a storeroom just across the hallway. The diligent girl must be continuing the inventory they had been making of the inn. Philomena would be required to register such a document to show all that would pass to her, should her mother fail to recover. Everything must be accounted for, every inch of land, gardens and pastures, the stables, the furniture of each one of the guest rooms, and her own suite as well as the servants' quarters. All the tapestries, rugs, plate clothes, jewellery, horses, saddles, even the money she was owed by the many courtiers to whom her family had made loans over the years. What a good sort Marianne was, neatly wrapping things back up and returning them to their place. Marianne, Philomena said as she stepped in, you must have your supper. The girl might work hard, but she was happy to leave, and Philomena took up the task. This storeroom was unfamiliar to her in comparison to the rest of the property. Here, in the half a dozen or so trunks that filled the place, her mother had packed away possessions guests forgot and might some day come to claim. Old hoes fetch loyalty, her mother opined. The sound of bootsteps interrupted Philomena. 
Sir John Norris, Blackjack, stood in the doorway. Her heart leapt up. The rooms he kept had been noticeably empty as he was holed up with a tutor to please his courtier father. He flashed a grin, and she started towards him, but then stopped herself abruptly. Their flirtation, innocent and playful enough, had always been contained by the watchful eye of her mother. The banter they had enjoyed, the accidental way his hand used to brush hers as they both reached for a chess piece, or his habit of sipping from her wine at table, looking up at her as he placed his lips exactly in the place hers had been, had made her laugh and her mother frown. Indulging in this type of fun unchaperoned would be, in the mind of a young man, an invitation to tangle the linen. With her long-dead father and her mother far away, she could no longer think of this young man as Blackjack, a wind to whip the hours by. He should now be thought of by his real title, Sir John Norris, a valuable client, a nobleman, a favourite of the Queen's. She said, Sir John, I cannot find the expression to say how I am pleased to see you. How Philomena drew herself up, Blackjack thought, and the array that hung from the golden chain on her girdle, keys for every room in the inn. He had last seen that hanging on her mother's skirt. Philomena's posture, the severity of her dark dress, her serious expression, it made him feel a bit off, as if he had gravy in his beard. They should have embraced. He would have kissed her hand, yet they stood apart. Sir John, in future, please tell me if there is something wanting in your rooms. I will see to it in my mother's absence, Philomena curtsied. Of course, the poor girl was worried about her mother. Blackjack saw that he had been remiss. He said, I was saddened to hear about Mistress Millicent. I trust that her health will improve away from the foul air of London. Why did he act as if it was she who made this greeting awkward, Philomena wondered. It was he, he who appeared, who acted as if nothing was altered. I accept with gratitude your gentle words. Stayed politeness, that irked Blackjack. Philomena was looking at him as if he were foolish to have come. Hell's fury, where was the old adoration? He struck a more forceful tone. Tush, do not be the innkeeper with me, Philomena. Master Stickley was having a fit downstairs. I was worried. Philomena considered the comment too forward and the interest in her business too familial. He was not to worry for her, but she was unsure of her footing. He knew her mother and Master Stickley well. He may have suspected Stickley's dishonesty. My mother truly trusted him. Blackjack felt such a rush of emotion. Was it sympathy? It was. It was sympathy. Philomena was melancholic about her mother. He saw that clearly now, and he could not be angry with her. He smiled. Mistress Millicent is a welcoming soul. I fault her for nothing. I count your mother a great friend. Her illness is unanswerable to me. She has been much in my thoughts. Philomena had also been in his thoughts her smooth hair and green eyes, how he liked it when she would spread herself out on cushions, reading and talking at her mother's feet, her alluring breasts peeking out, rolling hills on the agreeable landscape of her body. Yet this was not the time for such reflections. I heard of your mother's journey when I arrived at the inn. I tried to find you last night, but you were out. Did she understand his meaning, that she should not be out? making arrangements for popish masses. Very late, he added. I had to go to the Vitna. She and her mother kept a secret of their Catholicism. It was safer and, as her mother said, made all relationships easier. But this blackjack was by nature observant. Philomena was sure he suspected the truth. I hope that wine is for the inn's cup and not another purpose. He was the Queen's man, Philomena thought, a Protestant. She could not push him, or his obligation would lead him to the religious authorities, as his position demanded. Indeed, I hope you will enjoy a cup of wine with Sir Ralph. I fear Sir Ralph will drink it all. This was an absurd turn, Blackjack thought, this coldness between them. He would not accept it. She liked him still, she must. She admired him, of that there was no question. He was charming, all women liked him. I have no appointment to keep. Perhaps you would like some company? Philomena admitted to herself that she thought him decent company. I am sorting these trunks for inventory. I am excellent at sorting. I thought you excelled at drinking Malmsey wine. A man can excel at many things. Very well. Why should I deny you? Philomena turned to the trunk nearest the door, and together they lifted off the top. 
she pulled out an assortment of socks and linens and put them to one side. Blackjack found a fan and fanned himself, aping a noble lady. He noted Philomena's thin smile. He closed the fan. A cracked statuette of St. Sebastian caught Philomena's eye. The poor thing has lost his arrows, she said, rooting around until she found the miniature weapons and carefully stuck them into the carved wounds. The owner may have given up the old ways and no longer needs to carry statues on travels, particularly ones whose arrows might drop out. If you carry a drowned saint, must you haul about the water? Blackjack asked. Philomena answered his teasing with aggressive practicality. Often lodgers intend to return but never do. Think of your rooms. They are full of old gigaws. Gigaws? I have many rare novelties. Tell me, if I am killed in the field, will my lifetime of well-chosen treasure end up in this room? Why do you jest? There is no humour in that question. Your belongings would not be here. Your family would come to claim them. Things left here belong to a bastard son or a mercenary. Or a man who is keeping secrets far from home. From the bottom of the chest, Blackjack drew an elaborate box. On one side was a sweet-faced cat worked in beads, and on the other fat little birds eating shimmering green insects. He opened it with anticipation. With such a beautiful case, I thought this the stone of scone. But it is only a batch of papers. They may be valuable. Put them aside if you please. Philomena pulled an ornamented candlestick out of a roll of holland cloth. Are those jewels or glass? Blackjack asked, edging closer to her. Glass? Yet they will fetch a good price. Philomena caught his delicious scent, exercise and the saffron he sweetened his clothes with, familiar yet too intimate. His face almost touched hers, there was a small gash under his hairline, which his black curls had hidden until this moment. What a wonderfully straight nose he had. How dispiriting if it were made rough and crooked in some pointless battle. How sad it would be to lose one of those brown eyes to a well-aimed arrow. Oh, fie! What concern was it of hers? She was acting a half-wit. Sir John, there are so many chests. You should look in that one. She indicated the other side of the room. This one is yet unopened. Blackjack flipped the top of the chest next to her, revealing a pile of lustrous furs. These would keep a lonely man warm in the night. Philomena blocked the innuendo from her mind, taking refuge in the sensible. My mother should have sorted these chests. She was ever thinking about the next guest. Feel how soft these are. From here I can see their softness. Seeing softness... A rare talent. I will give you a very good price for one of these. Even if you are a man who has more money than he needs, you should not spend it recklessly, Sir John. Philomena, you have taken up the role of the prudent innkeeper quickly, but two months ago dancing was your occupation. This is the legacy left me, and I am fortunate for it. The way his eye rested on her was unsettling. Sir John, I thank you for helping me with this task. What was wrong with this girl? Blackjack asked himself. She was speaking to him as she might to that ancient Baron Liesel. He would not stomach it. This Sir Johnning, how it grates on my ear. To you, I have always been Blackjack, Philomena. Better he thought his name inconsequential to her, Philomena decided. As you will, Blackjack, turning again to the work at hand. You oblige me, he retorted stiffly. A voice from the landing filled the room. Oh, Mistress Arundel! Oh, Mistress Arundel! Then a groan, followed by wheezing. Sir Ralph, I am coming! Philomena called, taking the opportunity to break the awkward moment. She stepped from the room, alone with the storage chests and his frustration at this changeable girl. Blackjack yanked an arrow out of the plaster St. Sebastian and stabbed it into his thumb. Philomena coaxed Sir Ralph to his chamber, chastising herself for not having a fine room on the ground floor for such a loyal guest. The man groaned and puffed as he heaved his huge bulk up the stairs. He broke her heart with his shockingly good nature. It haunted her to think how he might come down. Perhaps she could roll him, like an egg. Poor man, his gut was his world. Hiring some strong boys to carry him up and down the stairs would show her concern and her respect. 
Bidding Sir Ralph good night, she returned to the storage room to finish her task. Blackjack was gone, so he could not wait for a few brief moments while she helped another guest. Of course, it did not matter. She had in no way expected him to wait, even though she knew he was not busy and probably had simply gone to the drinking room to find some other pettish noble to waste the night with. Good. They would spend lots of gold. She took a few turns around the chests aimlessly and decided it was late and she did not feel up to finishing. She picked up her inventory and, spotting the ornate box that Blackjack had found, thought she might take a look inside. She went to her own chamber, where Marianne was laying out bedclothes. Mistress, pardon me for not returning to help you in the storeroom. I did not wish to intrude on you and Sir John Norris. You are considerate, Marianne, but you would have been welcome. Sir John would not have welcomed me, mistress. He is a friend, not the sort I need to be left alone with. Marianne drew the curtains from Philomena's bed and fluffed the pillow. He is a handsome friend. I believe he is a handsome friend to many. I have not heard it, mistress. Tush, tush, Marianne. I heard his mother was called the Black Crow by the Queen herself because of the colour of her hair, and his is blacker still. Was it a tease, do you think? I would not like to be called a crow. I should like to have any nickname given by the Queen. You have sense, Marianne. Philomena donned her nightdress, cleaned her teeth, and Marianne helped her into bed. Settling herself comfortably against a bolster, she called a final time to Marianne to bring her the box. Alone, Philomena opened it and glanced through the papers. She recoiled to see the pages filled with love poetry. She was in no mood for the ridiculous things people wrote when they thought themselves in love. She resolved to read only the first lines. Go burning sighs onto the frozen heart to break the ice which pity's painful dart might never pierce. So extravagant, burning sighs, painful darts. She put the poem to the side. Then something else, a letter. This eleventh day of October, year of our Lord, 1542, by the hand of your loving brother. Dearest sister, I wish you comfort, though I know too well you prefer worry to contentment. My dear Agita, you know well I cannot waste worry on the machinations of the Lady Isabel Stoner or the menace of the King's discovery. For better or no, I will never give up this relic. It is the only crumb I have of one who can never be replaced. You mock me with your request. It is as if you feel nothing for the last vestige of a soul who did not buckle under the weight of Henry. And you prepare a nice embroidery. Think of organization and thrift. I convulse at your mind. You have always had breath cooled by the ice of your heart. Never will I cast the relic into the ocean or burn it on a pyre. I will not be rid of it. I say this again and again. My words spin on an endless wheel, and yet you heed them not. Do not ask again. It is safe and never leaves me. I keep it close. Do not warn me that Lady Isabel Stoner seeks it. She searches in vain. The tyrant Henry's business has left my edges frayed. The weather was harsh. I am stopping to rest a while with friends. What did this unfinished note mean, Philomena wondered. It was of much more interest than the poetical love fawning. The menace of the king's discovery. She felt it dangerous to read such words, much less to have penned them. Who was this bold courtier and the beheaded man he spoke of? Perhaps a rogue who deserved it. Or no, a Catholic. The Catholic heads rolled under King Henry. It must be a Catholic. Why else such love of a relic? Philomena read the page again. It was laden with intrigue. Why did her mother have such a thing? She had probably been in the thick of it, the luck of living in an inn. Philomena would ask to hear the story when her mother came home. If she came home. If brought a pinch to Philomena's breast. Her mother looked so pale as they took her off in the carriage. She had barely had the energy to whisper a goodbye. Philomena had helped make her comfortable for the long journey north to the rustic mansion of an old friend, speaking hopefully about a speedy recovery in the clean air of the country, trying to hide her fear that she might never see her mother again.
She was leaving London not only for fresh air, but also to be farther away from the Queen's religious authorities and closer to the Catholic priest her friend had hidden away on her estate. It would be a comfort for her mother to have a holy man by her bedside, a relief for the sick woman not to have to sneak to secret mass, not to have to hide away in her own establishment to say her prayers, not to have to search out a priest in back streets and dank windowless rooms. Philomena felt for the rosary and the book of hours she kept carefully hidden under her mattress. The gentle clink of the beads under her fingers calmed her as she prayed. Even I'm curious as to what happens next. <laughs> Here we are, away from court and in town. Lives are very, very different. Philomena Rundle is a fictional character, but like Constance, her family actually existed. There was indeed an Arundel Inn, and it was owned by Millicent Arundel in St. Lawrence Street, Cheapside. Yeah, and a lot of courtiers stayed there because the accommodations at court were weirdly cell-like. They were these tiny spaces that were smelly and had rats running around. I mean, unless you were the queen, of course, and then you had beautiful apartments. But uh, monarchs didn't feel responsible to spend money on their courtiers' rooms. They really didn't have to because the courtiers considered themselves lucky to be at court. So, you know, but no one likes to be uncomfortable. And those courtiers that had the money would rent rooms at what we would think of as like a, you know, five star hotel so they could get away from their bad rooms at court. The interesting thing is that even though Philomena doesn't have a title, she is in much better financial shape than Constance. But Constance is gentry. And Philomena will be lower status no matter how much money she has. And as a Catholic, she's in a doubly tenuous position. So when her steward threatens her, that something, that's something very serious. And at worst, she could get arrested. But even the insinuation that she's a Catholic could lose her guests and income and wreck everything. So let's talk about Sir John Norris, or Blackjack as he was nicknamed. Yeah, he's another real person. Uh, Sir John Norris was the grandson of Sir Henry Norris. So Sir Henry Norris was a courtier of Henry VIII and a very good friend of Henry's. Um, I think he might even have been his groom of the stool or something like that. Um, until Wiping Henry, his behind. <laughs> basically. Um, <laughs> until Henry, you know, decided to have him executed for supposedly having sex with Anne Boleyn. Um, Henry Norris was one of the five men who was executed um, with her, and it was it was terrible. And there are still reverberations in Elizabeth's court of all the things that happened in Henry's court with her mother and um, and all the families that were caught up in that whole situation. Because actually, the space between Anne Boleyn and the wives until the end of Henry reigns is quite it's quite short. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas the uh, Catherine of Aragon, there's many years. Right. They were married for 20 years, I think, something like that. So people say that Elizabeth never spoke of her mother, but she certainly showed a lot of gratitude to the families that were loyal to her mother despite anything. Right. Absolutely. And was, yeah, when she came to power herself, she kind of brought them up with her. And the Norris were one of those families. Um, and uh, Blackjack really was nicknamed by the Queen. She liked to give nicknames. It was a little power thing she did. Yeah. And he went on to be one of Elizabeth's greatest soldiers, and he was a member of the Queen's Guard. And for Philomena, that threat that Blackjack could denounce her is another fear that's uh, really worrying her in this chapter. Yes, and then, you know, her poor sick mother is, you know, she wants her to be able to to be able to have a priest. And sending someone north is something that really happened because the north is kind of a stronghold for the Catholics. And priests were outlawed in England at this time, but some were still smuggled in from the continent. You know, it's all it's all very tense. Right, it's a really tense time. So, so now Philomena has discovered this crazy anonymous letter and uh, let's see what happens in the next reading. <laughs> so as always, we have more info uh, on the characters in this chapter and on the history behind it. So go on over to our Facebook page, Tudor Time Machine. And remember to listen to more of Time's Riddle and hear more of our Tudor-minded talk. Bye.